Thank you very much for coming all the way. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Sergei, uh, for a very kind introduction. So my lecture today will focus indeed on the recent book that I released uh, um, in 30 languages across the globe, entitled The Journey of Humanity, The Origins of Wealth and Inequality. And the book is an attempt to understand the journey of human societies since the emergence of anatomically modern human in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago. And in particular, to resolve two of the most fundamental mysteries that surrounds this journey. What I will define as the mystery of growth, <coughs> namely the roots of the dramatic transformation in income per capita that occurred in the past two centuries after literally hundreds of thousands of years of near stagnation, and the mystery of inequality, namely the origin of the vast inequality in the wealth of nations, <coughs> why some countries are poor and others are rich. Now, over most of human existence, human life to a large extent was nasty, brutish, and short. In fact, humans were remarkably similar to any other species on planet Earth. Humans were preoccupied by survival and reproduction. Living standards were very close to the subsistence level, and living conditions did not differ greatly across time and across space. In fact, only a few centuries ago, nearly one-fourth of newborn did not reach their first birthday, and one-half of them did not reach their reproductive age. Large number of women perish during childbirth. Life expectancy fluctuated in a very narrow range of 25 to 40, and rarely exceeded 40, and perhaps more strikingly, an economic crisis did not lead into belt tightening, but rather into mass starvation and ultimately extinction. And then, in the past two centuries, we see this dramatic transformation that is occurring in the world economy. And this dramatic transformation is associated with a 14-fold increase in the standard of living across the globe. Income per capita in the world as a whole has increased 14-fold. Life expectancy has more than doubled. And there is a great divergence that is taking place in income per capita across countries and regions of the world. Now, in order to illustrate this metamorphosis, consider for a moment residents of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, 2,000 years ago and whisk them in a time machine forward about 2,000 years, namely to Ottoman rule Jerusalem at the beginning of the 19th century. Despite this 2,000 year jump forward in the course of human history, these individuals will be able to adapt instantaneously to the new environment. In fact, past knowledge would be largely applicable New technologies would represent only incremental change. Occupations would require very similar skills. And life expectancy would remain unchanged. And as a result of it, would not require changes in the individual mindset. Now, to illustrate the, the metamorphosis that occurred in the past 200 years, consider for a moment these res residents of Jerusalem at the beginning of the 19th century and whisk them forward only 200 years to contemporary Jerusalem of the 21st century. These individuals will be entirely shocked. In fact, past knowledge would be largely obsolete. Modern technologies would appear as witchcraft. Occupations would require incomprehensible skills, and life expectancy would instantly double, and as a result of it, would require a change in the individual mindset, a future-oriented mindset, the ability to take education decisions, saving decisions, life cycle decisions. So something very dramatic occurred in the past 200 years, something that did not occur 
over the entire course of human history. And in contrast to the conventional wisdom, income per capita has not increased gradually in the course of human development. In fact, what we see in the course of human development is a gradual change or gradual improvement in the level of technology. But this improvement is converted into more people rather than into more prosperous people. And consequently, <coughs> living standards remain unchanged, although technological progress becomes faster and faster and faster. And in fact, the recent rise in living standards represent what I will define momentarily as a phase transition, namely an abrupt transformation that occurred in the world economy once a tipping point has been reached. So in order to see this, or to visualize this change in, in living standards in the past uh, 200 years, consider for a moment the evolution of income per capita in the past 2,000 years. And as you can see quite strikingly, it appears that there is an eruption that is occurring in the course of industrialization. Living standards are fluctuating very close to the subsistence <coughs> level over most of human history, and then suddenly, in the past 200 years, we see this incredible metamorphosis, an incredible spike in income per capita. In fact, if I would have removed the labels from this axis and I would show this output to a random scientist, probably this individual would suggest that this is an output of a seismograph detecting tectonic activities and uh, eruptions that occur across the globe. But this is, in fact, the evolution of income per capita in the course of human history. Indeed, there is an eruption that is associated with what I will define as a phase transition. <coughs> but interestingly enough, and very importantly, when this takeoff is taking place, it does not take place at the same time period across the globe. Some societies are taking off at the beginning of the 19th centuries and perhaps even earlier. Others only very recently, and as a result of it, given the fact that this transformation is associated with a 14-fold increase in income per capita across the globe, an enormous divergence is taking place across countries and regions of the world. So in fact, inequality at the beginning of the 19th century is negligible. If you look at the most advanced region of the world at the beginning of the 19th century and compare this region to the least advanced, at least region of the world, the ratio of income per capita will be about 3 to 1. If you look at this, this ratios today, it will be 15 to 1, 20 to 1, even 100 to 1, depending on how we define regions. So something very dramatic occurred in the world economy in the past 200 years. And it appears, if you think about the roots of inequality, that the roots of inequality were determined in the distant past, not only 200 years ago, but perhaps even earlier, because naturally decisions and uh, actions that were taken at the beginning of the 19th centuries were predetermined by the individual mindset that were formed in the course of human history. <coughs> so, Naturally, the resolution of these two fundamental mysteries, the mystery of growth and the mystery of inequality, will require the understanding of the forces that permitted the transition from stagnation to growth. It will require the identification of the forces that led into the differential timing of the transition across the globe, and will require a better understanding of the role of historical and prehistorical forces in this process of the transition from stagnation to growth. And once we will resolve these two fundamental mysteries, we will be equipped with better tools to design policies or strategies that could mitigate inequality across the globe. So based on this introduction, it should become very apparent that in order to understand inequality today, we have to understand the process of development in its entirety. And this, to a large extent, is the achievement of unified growth theory. It basically was a, a framework of analysis that allowed us to understand the process of development in its entirety. It's the beginning of, uh, of a time in the context of humanity uh, till the present. 
So if you think about the process of development, one can identify three fundamental phases in the process of development. The Malthusian epoch, the post-Malthusian regime, and the modern growth regime. The Malthusian epoch originates nearly 300,000 years ago, at the time of the emergence of Homo sapiens. And it spans over 99.9% .9 of human existence till the eve of the Industrial Revolution. At a certain point, we see that the world is taking off into the post-Malthusian regime and ultimately in the aftermath of the demographic transition into the modern growth regime. Now, the Malthusian epoch is very interesting in the sense <coughs> that it is characterized by important dualism. On the one hand, stagnation in living standards, but on the other hand, certain dynamism in forces that would ultimately bring about the transition from stagnation to growth. So what allowed humanity ultimately to take off from this poverty trap that was associated with the Malthusian forces are precisely the forces that were percolating during the Malthusian epoch and reach a critical point at the time of industrialization. And therefore, much of the inequality that we see across the globe today, I will argue that 86% of the variations in inequality today can be traced to deep-rooted factors that operated in the distant past. So when we think about this dualism that is associated with the Malthusian epoch, one should consider stagnation in living standards, namely income per capita that fluctuated around the subsistence level for a prolonged period of time, and life expectancy that fluctuated in a very narrow band between 25 to 40 for a prolonged period of time. But at the same time, as I said, dynamism in the context of technology, dynamism in the context of population, and dynamism in the context of human adaptation. Now, at any point in time, technological progress in the Malthusian epoch is very, very slow. But over 300,000 year period, we move from stone tool technologies to steam engine technologies in the eve of industrialization. Population growth at any point in time is very slow. But when we move from the eve of the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago, to the midst of industrialization, the population on planet Earth increases from two and a half million people to nearly one billion people, namely 400-fold increase within, this, within a time period that we define as Malthusian stagnation. And at the same time, we see the adaptation of individuals to the environment in which they operate. And it is this Malthusian dynamism that ultimately triggered the transition from stagnation to growth, and permitted, as I said, what we see across the globe. Now, so given this uh, viewpoint, that the Malthusian epoch is so important, we have really to have a better understanding how Malthusian forces ultimately affected human characteristics, institutions, and other aspects of human societies, and consequently led into this differential timing of the transition from stagnation to growth. So during the Malthusian epoch, technological progress existed as it exists today. It was significantly s s slower, but technological progress existed. But what was unique during the Malthusian epoch is that this technological progress had an income, impact on income per capita that was only transitory. Income per capita increased in the short run, but ultimately it led into reduction in mortality rates, greater um, uh, fertility rates, and as a result of it, this increase in resources were divided over larger segment of the societies, and income per capita reverted inevitably to the previous equilibrium position. And consequently, over this time period, quite strikingly, technologically advanced societies or land-rich economies had larger population densities, but very similar levels of income per capita. And evidence are quite striking regarding this relationship. If you look at the relationship, for instance, between the suitability of land for agriculture and population density, you will find very pronounced positive association. 
Namely, not surprisingly, more fertile places have higher population density. But that's not a surprise. But a surprising element is the lack of a re relationship between the suitability of land for agriculture and economic prosperity. Namely, this fertile land <coughs> was converted into more people rather than into richer people. And the same holds for uh, technology. In addition, during the Malthusian epoch, we see great amount of adaptation. We know that the size of the population is affected by the level of the population, but not only the size of the population, the composition of the population. Survival is differential, and consequently, you, the human population is adapting in differential ways to the environment in which people operate. So different traits, whether they're cultural or individual, that are complementary to the growth process, tautologically generate higher income. But during this period, higher income is converted into higher reproductive success. And consequently, these traits become more and more prevalent in society. <coughs> and consequently, adaptation is raising the prevalence of growth-enhancing traits in the population, reinforcing the transition from stagnation to growth. So overall, during the Malthusian epoch, <coughs> the size of the human population and the composition of the human population is affecting technological progress. More people, more potential innovators, greater technological innovations. More adaptable people, again, greater technological innovations. And on the other hand, greater technological innovations permit more people to survive and more people to adapt. And these wheels of change are rotating in the course of human history. And in fact, population and technology are reinforcing one another over time. And inevitably, the rate of technological progress at a certain point reaches a stage where technological acceleration requires human capital, education, so as to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment. So human capital becomes essential in the production process, as I said, due to the fact that human capital permits individuals to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment. <laughs> human capital is being formed, but naturally, parents are too poor to educate their children, and they have to economize on other elements in their budget constraint. And the element that they economize on is the number of children. Namely, human capital formation is triggering a fertility decline, this is the onset of the demographic transition that occurs, for instance, in England in the 1870s. And consequently, the Malthusian equilibrium vanishes. The counterbalancing effect of population on the growth process vanishes. And as a result of it, the growth process is being triggered by technological progress, human capital formation, and the <coughs> decline in population growth. And this allows the economy to sail into the sustained growth regime. And this illustration is quite, uh, uh, quite insightful in the context of uh, what I just described. So you can, see the three, you can see the three wheels of change. The size of the human population, the composition of the human population, and technological progress. They are reinforcing one another in the course of human history. Humanity starts in Africa 300,000 years ago. The size of the human population is very modest, but unlike other species, humanity is equipped with a powerful human brain. And this powerful human brain permits individuals to innovate. These are not the innovations of, of our time period. This is stone tool technologies, but nevertheless, innovations are taking place. And these innovations permits more people to survive. And more people implies more potential innovators. And this reinforcing interaction between the adaptation of the human population, the size of the human population, technological progress <coughs> is reinforcing the growth process. And as technological progress becomes more and more rapid, the potential demand for human capital increases. But this potential is not generating any reaction because it is below a tipping point above which individuals would react. So there is a growing demand for human capital for a while,
But only once the growing demand for human capital reaches a critical threshold, we see suddenly that parents, as we see, for instance, in England in the course of the 19th century, invest massively in the education of their children. Once they do so, the fertility transition takes place. We see this phase transition, and the world is moving into the sustained growth regime. Now, it is very instructive to think about the following metaphor that is familiar to all of us, which is basically the transition from water to gas. So as you know, when you take a tea kettle and you boil some water in this tea kettle, the transition from water to gas takes some time. The sense that water are heating up for a long period of time with no change till a tipping point is being reached. The same holds true for the world economy. For a long period of time, technological progress was heating up, okay, very, very gradually over 300,000 year period, till it reached a critical point above which, in fact, we see the transition from the agricultural stage of development to the modern growth regime. But very importantly, when you observe water in a tea kettle and the evaporation process, you must have noticed that not all water molecules are converted into a gas state at the same time. Some are moving earlier than others. And as a result of it, if you wish, there is inequality across water molecules. The same holds true in the world economy. When this transition is taking place, some societies are moving faster than others, and as a result of it, an incredible inequality is emerging in the world economy. And the societies that are taking off first are not random societies, as it is the case in the context of water molecules. The position of water molecules in the teapot will determine which one will convert earlier than others. And the geographical position of societies across the globe, to a large extent, will determine which societies will move faster than otherwise. And as a result of it, it determines much of the inequality that we see across the globe today. So when you think about the roots of inequality today, as I said, much of it is originated initially in this differential transition from stagnation to growth, which in turn is based on historical and prehistorical forces that are leading into this differential transition. So when we think about the roots of inequality and the roots of uneven development, it is very tempting to think about cross-country differences in education, in machines, and in technology. That's, of course, very true. I mean, more advanced societies are more advanced technologically, more educated, and they use a better machinery. But this doesn't lead us virtually anywhere, in the sense that the question will remain why some societies fail to invest properly in education in machinery, and why some societies fail to adopt more advanced technologies. And this leads us to the realization that these differential decisions that are being made are conditioned by forces that operated in the distant past. Forces that operated, as you will see momentarily, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and even tens of thousands of years ago. And when we think about these historical and prehistorical forces, and we think about the deep roots of inequality today, we think, of course, about colonialism, but naturally the identity of the colonizers was not a random one. This is preconditioned on earlier differential development across the globe. We can consider, of course, institutions and cultural characteristics, but ultimately, as I will argue, most of these elements are <coughs> endogenous to the process of development. This leads us into the ultimate roots. And the ultimate roots, as I will argue momentarily, are based on geographical conditions and what I will define as societal characteristics. These elements ultimately determine the type of institutions and cultural characteristics that emerge across the globe. These are the factors that ultimately determine the identity of the colonizers, and these are the factors that determine the inequality as we see it across the globe. So when we think about colonialism, for instance, we typically think about extraction and potentially asymmetric trade. And the forces are very clear in the context of extraction, but let me elaborate about asymmetric trade in the context of unified growth theory. 
So when we think about colonies, colonies during the time of colonialism specialized in the production of agricultural goods and raw material. This was partly induced and partly forced. And this naturally reduced the demand for human capital because these goods are not human capital intensive in their production. But this is critical because the reduction in the demand for human capital implies delayed demographic transition and delayed transition to sustain economic growth. If you think about the colonizers, on the other hand, they specialize in the production of manufactured goods that are skill intensive. And consequently, this fostered human capital formation, fostered the decline in fertility, and consequently expedited the takeoff from stagnation to growth. So when we think about the role of colonialism, you can see how, in fact, colonialism can expedite the differential transition between, uh, between societies. But as I said, colonialism is not manna from heaven. It is based on earlier forces. So in the second part of the book, when I talk about the roots of inequality, I reverse the time clock. So rather than moving from Africa to the present, I move from the present back to Africa. Namely, I'm asking myself how inequality was determined. I focus on colonialism, and second, on institutions. So when we think about the fingerprints of institutions, we can think about the emergence of differential <laughs> institutions, political institutions and economic institutions across the globe. Some societies adopted for different reasons, growth-enhancing inclusive institutions. Other societies adopted growth-retarding extractive institutions. And as a result of it, we see some of the differential development across the globe. But it is important to note that in most cases, institutions are not simply manna from heaven. As I said, they're endogenous to the process of development. So there are some occasions call them in critical junctures, in which institutions are developed for random reasons, and they're very influential. So we can think about the impact of the Black Death, for instance, on the decline of feudalism in the UK, the emergence of property rights, and ultimately, perhaps, the early industrialization in, uh, in, in, the, in England. We can think about the impact of the Glorious Revolution, on the emergence of constitutional monarchy in England, and again, early industrialization in England. And we can think about the division of the Korea along the 38th parallel, and the creation of a communist hell in the north and some sort of uh, Western heaven in the south. Income per capita in southern Korea is 24-fold larger than in the north, although this is a society that is homogeneous ethnically, and this is a region of the world that is very similar geographically. So here, institutions will explain nearly 100% of the variations between the North and the South. This is predominantly economic institutions, not necessarily political institutions, because that we know that much of the divergence occurred while South Korea was still autocratic. But nevertheless, it is partly associated with political institutions as well. So it's important to note that institutions, as I said, were a byproduct of the process of development to a large extent. So when the Neolithic Revolution took place, when societies moved into agriculture 12,000 years ago, this transition increased population density significantly, led into the formation of cities, states and empires, and as a result of it, generated a demand for institutions that will coordinate the actions of individuals, will protect property rights, and will allow cohesiveness in the formation of public goods. Here is an example, very important one, in which institutions, as I said, are, is a byproduct of economic development. Ecological diversity led into trade and state formation, and consequently, for the demand and the supply uh, for institutions. Perhaps most importantly, soil suitability for large plantations led into the emergence of a large land-owning class. Consequently, concentration of political power and ultimately extractive institutions and slavery. So the presence of extractive institutions in Mesoamerica is not an accident. 
It's not a critical juncture. It's a byproduct of the geographical endowment that prevailed in these societies and permitted the emergence of a very uh, strong uh, uh, land-owning class. If you think about sub-Saharan Africa and high disease environment there, it led into low population density and consequently delay in the adoption of centralized institutions and economic development. So this suggests to us that if we really want to understand the roots of development, we cannot stop with institutions. Institutions will explain well the case of Korea, perhaps for some other cases, but to a large extent, institutions are byproduct of the geographical endowment and human characteristics. So this takes us to the role of culture. And yet again, in the context of culture, we see the different societies, different regions of the world are adopting differential cultural traits. Some regions are adopting growth-enhancing traits, future-oriented <coughs> mindset, social capital. Other regions of the world are, in, are adopting growth-retarding traits, such as family ties. And as you know, this division uh, between, say, family ties and social capital was invoked to explain the, uh, the divide between the southern and the northern part of Italy, naturally a region that is subjected to the same institutions and the same, to a large extent, the same uh, ethnicity, and nevertheless is characterized by uh, significant differences in, in economic prosperity. <coughs> But again, in the context of, of, of culture, it is very important to note that there are rare instances in which we see cultural mutations, namely the emergence of cultural mutations out of the blue. We see it, in fact, in the context of the imposition of mandatory literacy in Judaism in the first century CE. This is an entirely capricious idea that is advanced by, by Jewish sages at the time, with no economic motivation, but ultimately, it persists due to the fact that education becomes so valuable in, uh, in societies and particularly in, uh, in the urban societies. Or you can see it in the context of the Protestant Reformation, emphasis on thrift and entrepreneurial spirit is very critical for the understanding of uh, what we call today the spirit of capitalism. But as I said, these are rare instances in which culture is based on random mutations. In most cases, culture evolves as a byproduct of the process of development and the geographical endowment. So when there is a rise in the demand for human capital in the course of the Neolithic Revolution and later on, we see a persistent increase in the predisposition towards child education. When the environment is characterized by clim climatic volatility, we see the emergence of trust, and we see the emergence of loss aversion, the facts entrepreneurial spirit and cooperation. When the society is characterized by high crop yield, then farmers are induced to be engaged in the process of planting and harvesting and storing, plant storing seeds for the future. And consequently, nature is training individuals to be future-oriented in, in their mindset. This, as I said, is critical for the process of development because future-oriented mindset controls education decision, saving decisions, and technological adoption. And when uh, certain regions of the world are more suitable for the adoption of the plow, we see the emergence of gender division of labor and gender biases. Naturally, the plow requires significant upper body strengths, and as a result of it, the equal division of labor that existed in agricultural production prior to the adoption of the plow is being replaced by gender inequality in which men are cultivating the land and women are confined into a, a house, a, a house production. So again, Culture will take us. I mean, culture is very important, but naturally, they're underpinning to cultural traits as we see it across the globe. This leads us into the understanding that, in fact, geography is very important. And when we think about geographical characteristic, we can think about soil quality, climate, disease environment, and geographical isolation. 
And these elements have an indirect, if you wish, long shadow impact on, as I said, cultural and institutional characteristics. And in addition, geography may have a direct impact on economic development today, although this direct impact on land productivity, human capital formation, trade, and technological diffusion is in fact mitigated by information technology revolution, by transportation technology, and the diffusion of medical health technology into less developed societies. So when we think about the legacy of agriculture, we are drawn back to events that occurred as early as 12,000 years ago, namely at the time of the onset of agriculture. And during this time period, we see the transition of human societies from hunter and gatherer tribes to agricultural communities. This transition is associated with the emergence of a non-food producing class. And this class is devoting its time to knowledge creation in the form of science, technology, and written languages. And since the Neolithic Revolution is not occurring at the same time period across the globe, it implies that there is a technological head start for some societies over others. So the Neolithic Revolution occurs <coughs> in the Fertile Crescent about 12,000 years ago, in China about 10,000 years ago, etc. So these differences in the timing of the Neolithic Revolution are generating huge differences in the te technological end start. And as suggested by Der Jared Diamond in his thesis, variation in the timing of the Neolithic Revolution across the globe can govern some of the inequality that we may see across the globe. But unfortunately to the Diamond hypothesis, the evidence are not very complementary for the role of the Neolithic Revolution in today's inequality. There is significant impact of the Neolithic Revolution on economic development in the Middle Ages. But in fact, there is no impact whatsoever of the Neolithic Revolution on economic development today. And the reason is that the Neolithic Revolution is a mixed blessing. On the one hand, as suggested by Der Jared Diamond correctly, it leads into a technological head start. But on the other hand, it leads into comparative advantage in agriculture, which is low human capital intensive, and this delays the process of development. And what happens empirically is that two forces offset one another, and ultimately, this famous book of Diamond does not hold uh, much truth in understanding inequality across the globe. So as I said, ultimately, this, has, this draws us back all the way uh, to Africa, to the exodus of anatomically modern human from Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago. So humans are emerging out of Africa. They populate Europe around 45,000 years ago. They cross, into, they cross the Bering Strait around 25,000 years ago into North America as early as 23,000 years ago <clears throat> and into South America around 14,000 years ago. Now, why is this migration so important? This migration is so important because departing populations carry only a subset of the diversity that existed in the original African population. And this diversity can be cultural, phenotypic, behavioral, linguistic, and as we will show in, in a few weeks in a working paper that I'm about to release, in folkloric diversity as well. Now, migration is sequential, in the sense that people are moving into the Middle East or the Fertile Crescent, they reside there for a long period of time, and then they migrate into, into other locations. And as a result of it, there is lower level of diversity at human societies that settled at greater migratory distance from Africa. And the argument is very simple. So if you think about the society in Africa, in East Africa, it is the most diverse society in the world. People are departing into Africa, carrying with them only a subset of the diversity that existed there. Why is it the case? Simple statistical theory. It's a modest population in Africa. The departing population is small as well. And as a result of it, it's a non-representative sample of the entire diversity that existed in Africa. And as the process continues, as you can see, there is less and less diversity at greater migratory distance from Africa and the least diverse population in the world can be found in South America. And the evidence is very striking. Regardless of how you measure diversity, the further you are from Africa, the less diverse 
indigenous groups are. The most diverse population are in the world are the African, pop uh, African populations, followed by the Middle Eastern population, the European population, the Asian population, the Oceanian population, and Native America in, uh, in uh, yeah, Native Americans in South America. So those who migrated about 25,000 kilometers uh, from, uh, from Africa are the least diverse in the world. Now, why is it so important? It is important because diversity has conflicting effects on productivity. On the one hand, diversity has beneficial effects on creativity and innovations. It permits cross-fertilization of ideas, cross-pollination of ideas, and it fosters innovations. But on the other hand, as we know, it has adverse effect on social cohesiveness. And as a result of it, it is associated with mistrust, it is associated with disagreement about the desirable public goods, and ultimately, it is associated with conflict. And given these two conflicting effects, it suggests to us that, in fact, there is a sweet spot level of diversity in different stages of development that balances between these two forces. And in fact, the evidence are quite striking with this respect. What we would expect is a hump-shaped relationship between diversity and productivity, and this is what we see throughout human history, whether we measure productivity with population density in the past, urbanization in the past in, in, in panel B, income per capita today, or light, uh, light intensity in panel D. You can see this pronounced hump-shaped relationship. Now, importantly, if you look at the societies that are optimally diverse in the year 1500, these are societies in Southeast Asia, Japan, Korea, and, uh, and China. These are societies that typically are not considered to be, in our mind, diverse, and certainly not optimally diverse. But this is a different time period. This is a time period in which social cohesiveness is much more important than innovativeness, and in balancing between the two, these societies have the optimal balance. But as you can see in, in panel C, when we think about today's world, the society that is at the peak of the hump is in fact the US society. Namely, as we move into a more demanding technological environment, the benefits of diversity are increasing over time, and consequently what we observe is that uh, societies that are more diverse will have the upper hand. And this suggests to us that as we move into the future, into more and more demanding technological environment, perhaps the virtues of diversity will continue to increase uh, over time. Now, it's important to note this is not related necessarily to countries. If you look at all ethnic groups in the ethnographic atlas and you look at population density in the past 12,000 years, this pronounced hump shaped relationship will be maintained. It is independent of the data set it is being used. It is independent of the unit of observation that one can use. So when we think about the initial chart that I showed you earlier, you can see the wheels of change as before. They're rotating in the course of human history and leading ultimately to the transition from stagnation to growth. But importantly, these wheels of change are not ro rotating in a vacuum. They're affected by other elements. They're affected by institutions and culture. So if you live in a society that protects property rights, naturally technological progress will be more pronounced than otherwise. <coughs> if you live in a society in which the culture is adoring human capital formation, then again, the composition of the population will change accordingly, and this will expedite the rotation of the wheels of change. <clears throat> if you live in a society that is relatively diverse, okay, namely very close to Africa, this will be a hurdle in the process of innovations. If you live in a middle point from Africa, then this will be conducive for technological progress and for innovations. So naturally, these wheels of change are rotating differentially across the globe due to these differential forces leading into a differential timing in the transition from stagnation to growth. So if you think about the roots of comparative development and you think about the role of deep-rooted factors, then we can attribute nearly 90% of the variations in inequality today to forces that operated in the distant past. Forces that were formed, as I said, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and even tens of thousands of years ago. 
If you think about the dispersal of anatomically modern humans from Africa, it accounts for about 17 to 26% of the variation. If you think about time since human settlement and the Neolithic Revolution, about 3%, and it is mostly time since human settlement. Geoclimatic factors are incredibly important, around 30%. Disease ecology, around 10%. Cultural factors, about 20%. Political institutions in the form of constraint on the executive and polity four, three to nine percent. So this is a more holistic view of the process of development. It doesn't try to push a single force. As we know by now, I mean, being mature adult, there is nothing in the world that is affected by a single factor. And in this respect, certainly uh, people that advocated the role of institutions as the single force in economic development uh, did not do a good service to themselves. In fact, there are many forces that are operating behind the scene. And as you can see, much of them were determined in the distant past. Now, you can view the results as very disturbing, in the sense that perhaps this suggests to us that there is geographical determinism in the context of inequality, and history is a fate. And in fact, the viewpoint of the journey of humanity is that history is, in fact, not a fate. And by considering our history, we will be in a better position to design our future. But in fact, the policy prescription is very different than the one that was advocated, say, in the context of the Washington Consensus or policies that were advocated for a long period of time by the IMF and the World Bank. Namely, the policy prescription is country-specific, history-specific, and geographic-specific. This silly idea that one policy fits all nations at once is not applicable. And let me give you a very simple example. So think about diversity. As I said, there is great heterogeneity in the degree of diversity across the globe. And think about education policies in the context of diversity. So take highly diverse societies, somewhere in Africa, say Kenya. What would we like education to achieve there? To reduce the cost of diversity, to reduce the degree of diversity. How do we achieve this? By educating people so as to foster social cohesiveness and tolerance. This is achievable. This is, in fact, part of the curriculum in much of the Western world. But think about a homogeneous society. Take China, for instance, that perhaps is overly homogeneous for its, own for its own cause. There, we would like to foster the ability of individuals to challenge the status quo. We would like, in fact, the education system to be such so as to, that will induce individuals to think critically about the status quo, to respect pluralism, and ultimately to adopt pluralism in society. So naturally, the same budget, the same education policies will be applicable in a very differential way across societies that are diverse and societies that are homogeneous. Or in the context of cultural traits, we think about growth-enhancing cultural traits, such as trust and uh, in political and individual institutions. If certain individuals resided in places where colonial history and corruption led into this trust, Again, greater emphasis should be placed in this education system on the, uh, and the development uh, of, uh, of trust. And perhaps most importantly, in the context of future-oriented mindset. As I said, there are great differences in the degree of future-oriented mindset across the globe, and they are associated with geographic endowment. Those societies that came from places where the return to agricultural investment was higher developed the ability to delay gratification, developed the ability to plan for the future. But say society of fishermen that was not induced to think long term did not develop this long term orientation. And consequently, the proper education policy will be such that in places where native crops were not conducive for planting, harvesting, and consequently long-term orientation, much of the education uh, curriculum should be focused on instilling long-term orientation. For instance, exposure, exposure to medical instru musical instruments. So broadly speaking, if you read carefully the journey of humanity, 
the key to universal prosperity, according to the journey of humanity, is flexible education. It will allow you to cope with rapidly changing technological environment. Gender equality that will be conducive for further reduction in fertility and greater labor force participation of women. Future-oriented mindset that will allow people to adopt uh, better technologies and to educate themselves. Tolerance so as to mitigate the cost of diversity and in the fostering of diversity in places where pluralism is, uh, is at the moment uh, suboptimal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roger. It's been really great. Uh, we have a uh, discussion with uh, Ben Marks. Uh, thank you, Sergei, and, and thank you very much, Odette, for uh, vi visiting us here in Paris and giving us a great uh, summary and, and snapshot of this, uh, of this wonderful book, which I I really enjoyed reading, uh, so I'm very, I'm very honored to give this discussion. I'll try to keep it short, obviously. Uh, it's also a daunting task to discuss uh, in less than 10 minutes a book that itself provides a history of mankind in less than 300 pages. So we're, we're reaching levels of compactness that are, that are quite uh, amazing. Uh, I want to start with a very brief anecdote, which uh, I, it, it, it's a conversation that I was reminded of when I reached the last chapter of the Journey of Humanity, a uh, conversation I had with an American friend many years ago who happens to be very fond of European literature. And it's, uh, you know, in that conversation, I was very ashamed to admit this to him. Uh, it took me, you know, many years. Ultimately, I did. I said, look, Adam, that's his name. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, never, I never read Shakespeare. Uh, I, perhaps it's, it's because I'm French, I don't know. I've seen plays, I've uh, seen the excerpts of text, but I've never actually held a book that says Shakespeare on it. And he was obviously horrified, but he was also very gracious about it, and his reaction was to say, I'm very jealous, actually, because the best uh, moments in your life are ahead of you, and you are going to be surprised when you read Shakespeare. And the reason I'm, I'm saying this is that if you, if you are not an economist, if you are not an, academ uh, an academic, you will be surprised by the journey of humanity, and especially you will be surprised by its ending. Uh, the book, like Odette said, has this beautiful sort of ascending structure and then descending structure. And once you arrive at the end, uh, you do get the sense that there, is, that there are some keys to understanding the mystery of growth and the mystery of inequality, and, and that's, that's truly wonderful. Uh, the first thing I want to say, really, more, more substantially about the journey of humanity is that it is a book um, that is full of humanity. And, and what I mean by that is that it's something that really transpires through the book that the person who's writing is someone who loves diversity. Obviously, diversity has positive and, and negative effects, and you show, that, you show that throughout your career very well. Uh, but you know, the way you, you bring up examples of what different civilizations, different cultures have brought um, to mankind, I, I, f I find that truly remar remarkable. And I think it makes uh, the book very easy to read. It, make, it also sets it apart from other books that this will be compared to. Guns, Germs, and, and Steel, uh, Why Nations Fail, all of these books, uh, I, think, I think yours is the one that, that really appears to be the most human book uh, of, of the lot. Uh, but more than these books, the, the, the contribution that this reminded me of is a different one that uh, perhaps if you're French, you've, you've heard about uh, in, uh, previously in your education. It's a short book that was written by Claude Lévi-Strauss, an anthropologist uh, in the 50s called Race Histoire, Race and History. Uh, it was a book that was commissioned by UNESCO in 1952 to Lévi-Strauss as part of attempts to debunk uh, racist theories at the time. And it's a wonderful book, uh, which I think uh, Odette's book, 50 years later, 70 years later, provides a very nice sequel to and an answer to. And after I read The Journey of Humanity, I went back to this book by Lévi-Strauss to, to understand why, why I was sort of making this connection in my, in my head. And, and the reason I was was that Lévi-Strauss had a number of really important hypotheses, which at the time were very speculative, and, and what Odette did throughout his career was to actually bring evidence to a lot of these hypotheses that were already you know, speculated about in the 50s. So I'll, I'll just read a very short e extract from this book. In the interrelations of human societies, one wonders if there may be an optimum degree of diversity, he underlines, he underlines optimum, which they cannot exceed, but under which they shall also not go without incurring risks. This optimum 
might vary as a function of the number of societies, their numerical strength, their geographical distance from one another, and the means of communication at their disposal. The problem of diversity, in fact, does not only arise with regard to the reciprocal relationship between cultures, it also exists within each individual society with regard to the relations among all the constituent groups, the various caste, classes, professions, or religious denominations that develop certain differences and that each of them considers to be extremely important. And he concludes, the diversity of human cultures is in the present and in the past much greater and much richer than we will ever know. And I, I do think there are, there are very nice connections between these, these two different you know, pieces of work, 70 years apart from each other. The other thing that they have in common, I think, is that these are courageous contributions. This, you know, the Journey of Humanity is a book that is not afraid of tackling difficult questions about the relationship between culture and economic development. For example, these are questions that always come up in a classroom where you teach students about the role of institutions, for example. I've, insti I've, I've experienced this in this very classroom. No matter how hard you try to tell students, you know, institutions are the primary reason for uh, you know, inequality in the world and differences in comparative development, students will come up to you and say, but what about culture? What about religion? Why have, uh, why have you know, the, 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 uh, the papers that you're presenting us not explicitly taken those into account? I think uh, your book does this, uh, does this very well. So in the, the remaining time that I have, the, what I want to do is, since we are lucky to have you in the room, I want to ask you questions that are more prospective in nature. And that sort of, you know, I think come to mind once... Uh, once you have finished uh, reading The Journey of Humanity, which I hope uh, will be the case of everyone in this room very soon. Um, basically, you know, going back to the analogy that you gave us with the kettle and the boiling water, I want to know where you think we are in that process. Now that the water has boiled, where do we go from there? Um, you know, and, and is your outlook and your take on this question you know, more on the optimistic or the, or the pessimistic side? So I'll, I'll make this question more specific uh, in two different ways. The first, you know, the first set of questions I think that arises naturally after, after reading The Journey of Humanity has to do with climate change. You talk about climate change in the book um, and you, you, know, you, you argue uh, something which I generally agree with, which is that the forces that have been at play while the water was boiling until today namely you know, technological change and uh, changes in population size and composition, the same forces will mitigate uh, the effects of climate change or will determine the fate of societies, human society, as climate change uh, unfolds. And I, I, I would love you to tell us more about that, in particular about the notion of uh, you know, what, what role does population growth or, or the fertility transition play in the context of, of climate change. When I, when I think about these issues and I, I go into a dark place thinking about these issues, what I, the, the examples I've had, I have in mind typically are the fact that you know, China, which is a country that today emits most CO2 in the world, has already accomplished their fertility transition. So what's going to happen? And of course, the CO2 that they produce is, has largely to do with products that they sell to the rest of the world. Uh, you know, the second country in that list is the US, which emits twice more CO2 than India. Obviously, you know, the U.S. has already accomplished their fertility transition as well. So how do you see these fertility forces at play in the context of cl climate change? In the short and the medium run, you know, is there a very dark take on this, which is that, yes, there will be a population adjustment, mostly in developing countries. What do we do about this? I would, I would love to hear your thoughts. The second... Uh, should I? Okay. I'm recording those. Uh, okay. so. I'll, I'll have, I only have one more, and then I'll, I'll okay. leave the floor to, uh, to okay, it. I'm writing, I'm writing yeah. those down, so yeah. I, I will remind you. The, the second question has to do with education specifically, and I love the fact that you end the book with education and the role of education in uh, sort of mediating the impact of diversity on, on economic growth and, and development. Um, but I can't help thinking that this is really hard to do in practice, and in particular, you know, when, when we think about the notion of education as um, you know, facilitating the integration and the cohesiveness of diverse societies. How do we go, how do we go about this? The, the typical Western model of mass homogeneous secular education uh, you know, sometimes struggles in other diverse settings. There are resistances to uh, being imposed from the top, an education system that doesn't fit for all, and, and typically you know, all these frictions, these resistance, 
at the core of the difficulty of coming up with flexible education systems that can cater to such, uh, to such diversity. And then the last sort of sub-question that has to do with education, and that's more thinking about you know, countries at the technology frontier, the US, Western Europe, and other places, what is the future of education there, given the importance of uh, human capital formation at various stages of history, as you describe in the book, um, in a world where you know, many skills have become redundant and not all technological change is labor augmenting, um, and we are trying to teach students and pupils not just skills, but also you know, learning how to learn, that world is also um, upset by and, and disrupted by the arrival of, of artificial intelligence. I have many friends in, in that industry that made a more lucrative choices than me when I, <laughs> when I uh, exited grad school. Uh, but they are convinced, for example, that even, you know, first of all, we don't know how to teach kids how to learn. We don't really know what this means in the, in, in the modern age and in the age of AI. Uh, and even that is, it's not clear that this will give jobs to students, uh, to, you know, to, to everyone in the future. And so when I was reading this part of your book, um, I sort of started to worry that, you know, given what, what you tell us and so on, 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 on mass education, are we going to go back to a world where education is sort of the privilege of a happy few? Uh, having a broad-based good education is really reserved to a certain elite that is able to navigate the world of understanding what skills are truly needed to survive in the job market of the, of the modern world. I'll stop there. Uh, thanks very much, and, and uh, we, I look forward to this discussion. Okay. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, I, should, I should say that Ben is not only an assistant professor, but also a gr graduate of Sciences Po, so we Correct. do teach OK. And this is, uh, and this is where I, uh, I read we, his book. So. Yeah, we, we do teach interdisciplinarity exactly. and some history. As, as you studied before, uh, before 10 years ago, I should tell you that now we not only teach institutions, we also teach <laughs> culture, and we teach Galore's papers in those courses. Excellent. At Excellent. least I so Galore. Uh, two questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very insightful discussion, a very kind one. Uh, so let me try to address uh, the three questions that I was asked. And the first one is about, uh, perhaps uh, can be defined as uh, the march of humanity. Is the march of humanity unstoppable? Is it a relentless march? Or are we about to hit uh, some upper bound in this march that has to do with climate change or some sort of uh, political upheaval that the world is experiencing at the moment. And to a large extent, when we reviewed uh, the journey of humanity in its entirety, in some sense, the journey of humanity is providing us with uh, assurances about human ingenuity and the ability of humanity to face these critical junctures and ultimately to prevail and to maintain its momentum uh, and its relentless march forward. So let's think about it for a moment, even in the context of the onset of the Neolithic Revolution. So 12,000 years ago, as we said, humanity is marching from hunting and gathering tribes into agricultural communities. But before that, what we see is that, in fact, different geographical niches across the globe are being populated, and as a result of it, we get into a stage in which hunting and gathering is no longer feasible in the old-fashioned way. You cannot continue to march because you bang into tribes that are very close to you. And in the absence of ingenuity, this would have led into mass extinction of the human population and certainly incredible amount of conflicts and belligerence across human societies. But what, in fact, we see during this time period is that human ingenuity comes to play. Individuals learn how to domesticate plants and animals, and ultimately the transition uh, to agriculture is taking place where individuals are able to extract from each acre of land 100 times more than what hunter and gatherers were able to extract from the same acre of land. So this is one important case, and I should just state it in the context of those individuals that refer to the agricultural revolution as the worst mistake in human history. So several people, perhaps even Jared Diamond, but certainly Harari, is basically focusing on this idea that somehow the transition to agriculture 
is associated with, with a terrible mistake. And the reason that they make this statement is that in the aftermath of the Neolithic, of the, the Neolithic Revolution, archaeological uh, remains suggest to us that there is a decline in life expectancy, there is an increase in work of effort, and there is a severe decline in the health of individuals. But naturally, what these individuals do is that they really don't understand economic mechanism. What happened in the course of human history is that, yes, hunter-gatherers for a long period of time lived better, but at the time of the transition, economic conditions deteriorated in such a way that the individual at the margin were indifferent between being hunter-gatherers and agriculturalists. But we don't have skeletal remains that are coming at any, any year. And as a result of it, archaeologists have skeletal remains from 3,000 be years before the Neolithic <coughs> Revolution and a few thousand years after. And they see a jump, and they infer from this that this is the worst mistake in human history. But as I said, what happened over this time period is that it, there is a gradual decline in the a standard of living of humanity, and at the time of the transition, in fact, there is no further decline and extinction is avoided. So again, we see human ingenuity comes to play, and that's, uh, that's very reassuring. Now, in addition, think about uh, other time period in, in human history that appeared to the individuals who lived during this time period as catastrophic and, and, and perhaps uh, uh, devastating uh, for eternity. Think about the Black Death, right? The Black Death is decimating 40% of the <coughs> European population, and nevertheless, humanity is emerging out of the Black Death with greater force, with better technologies, and ultimately, uh, we don't see that the relentless march of humanity is affected by it. Or we can focus on the 20th century. Think about uh, World War I, or World War II, or the Spanish flu, or the Great Depression. So these are, uh, these are momentous events that are occurring over this time period, and the individuals that are living during this time period are devastated for a long period of time. But nevertheless, when you look at the march of humanity, the march of humanity is really not deviating from its long-term trend. So think about yourself three years ago. We were hit by COVID-19, and there was an air of gloom among us. I mean, people felt that life will never revert to what it used to be. And again, human ingenuity, mRNA technologies, brought us, in fact, to a position where I can visit Paris and we can sit here without masks after a three-year period. So human ingenuity is there, and to a large extent, in this respect, we can be reassured about certain forces about the march of humanity. But naturally, climate change is perhaps the most, uh, uh, the most critical or the most uh, uh, formidable force that is about to hit humanity. And there, as you suggested, my book suggests that when we think about the current trend of climate change, it emerges at the beginning of the 19th century with industrial pollution. So it is technological acceleration that brings about the steam engine and brings about as a spillover, negative spillover, negative externality, climate change. But at the same time, this technological acceleration is bringing about human ingenuity, education, and decline in fertility. Three critical forces that would be crucial, crucial in mitigating climate change. We have a much more educated population, and consequently, we can instruct people, and we can advise people to recycle, to adopt environmentally friendly technologies, what would not have been feasible at the beginning of the 19th century. We have a much more ingenious population, and therefore, we can expect that certain technologies that we cannot envision at the moment will emerge in the next few decades and perhaps will allow us even to reverse climate change. And we have a gradual decline in the size of the human population, of the growth rate of the human population and ultimately in the actual size of the human population that is reassuring as well because in the end, we are polluting planet Earth. And if we have, there are few of us, the fewer of us, this will uh, be critical in the context of economic development. So in fact, certain research that, that I wrote on the subject suggests that if you reduce population growth by 1%, 
you can increase the growth rate of income per capita by 7% and maintain carbon emission unchanged. Namely, carbon emission is much more, much more sensitive to the size of the population to total output. And in this respect, there is hope that if, in fact, we will adopt the policies that I suggested earlier, gender equality, emphasize, uh, and, and, and other elements that will foster innovations and will foster a decline in fertility, then perhaps we can buy scientists three or four decades to develop these revolutionary technologies that we cannot envision at the moment that can hopefully uh, mitigate climate change. So this is my view about, uh, about climate change. Now, you asked two related questions about uh, the future of education and how should we uh, envision uh, the future of education and the, the future prosperity of humanity in, in this dimension. So, in, in fact, I mean, recently the, my book was released in, uh, in China, and the Chinese are really obsessed about the issue of, uh, of the size of the population. They're really concerned about the fact that uh, that uh, the Chinese population will start to decline in absolute numbers. They're concerned about the fact that fertility rate is below replacement level. And they think about the conventional argument about dependency ratio. The dependency ratio is increasing, and consequently, the growth process of China is unsustainable. And my typical answer is, again, rooted in the, the ideas of the quantity-quality trade-off. When we think about dependency ratio, we simply count heads. But in fact, we have to have an adjusted dependency ratio that takes into account the productivity of the younger generation. And typically, when typically the, this the Chinese journalists were, were discussing with me these issues, I was basically talking about their personal history. They are naturally single, each of them is a single child with great earning capacity. And two generations ago, the, the, the number of offspring that, exist, that existed there was significantly larger. But naturally, if you sum the earning capacity of these individuals, it is significantly smaller than this single child that is a journalist at the moment. So in this respect, I'm not overly concerned about the fact that the scale of the human population will bring to a halt the rate of technological progress. I think that what we need to, to take into account is the elasticity of human capital with respect uh, to uh, the decline in, uh, in population, and then the elasticity of technological progress with respect to education versus the scale of the population. And at least my preliminary, preliminary estimates suggest that, in fact, we are operating in the right direction, in the sense that ultimately we will be able to see the sustainability of technological progress, despite the fact that the human population will decline and will alleviate some of the concerns about, uh, about climate change. Now, as to the question about the nature of education, so as I emphasize throughout, I would like to think about uh, flexible education as the education of the future. And when we think about this process of technological acceleration and its impact over time on the return to education and inequality across the globe, yes, the world in the past five decades is experiencing an incredible increase in inequality, partly due to technological acceleration and uh, uh, to a smaller extent, globalization. And in this respect, one can perhaps argue that inequality is an inevitable byproduct of this process, in the sense that technological acceleration is increasing the return to certain type of traits that are scarce in society. And consequently, <coughs> those individuals that are holding these scarce talents are earning much more than before, and inequality will be widened uh, over time. Now, so if we think about it from the viewpoint of policy, the question is what is the responsible policy in this dimension? So first, we have to assure equality of opportunities. Why? Because in some sense, there is a technological lottery that we all play in. Some of us are more compatible with this technology, others are less, and as a result of it, inequality is a byproduct of it. But if every individual is entering into this lottery with fair chance of winning, the lottery ticket, then in fact, some of this inequality will be more tolerable than others. Namely, both 
from a moral viewpoint and from the viewpoint of social unrest, we have to assure that there is great confidence that equality of opportunity is prevalent, is prevalent. namely that there, is, there are no individuals that are left behind in the potential process of education. It doesn't imply that everyone will be able to be properly educated because, again, these traits are relatively scarce. Um, but again, this will not resolve the entire issue in the sense that in the end, even if the lottery is fair, there will be certain grievances and we should be prepared to a large extent to, uh, to adopt greater safety, safety nets than we adopted in the past. So in some societies, say in the American societies, the idea of safety nets perhaps is foreign to the culture because people see that this is contradictory to, to the proper incentives. But we have to realize that we move into a different world in which, in fact, this, what I call the technological lottery, is very harsh, and some individuals simply cannot cope with this technological environment, and inequality as a result of it is an inevitable byproduct of it, and we should be, uh, should have more mercy and more uh, uh, different moral views about uh, safety nets. As I said, this will be morally right, but in addition, it will prevent great social unrest that will be a byproduct of it. And in the context of AI, here I have, my views are slightly different in the sense that, uh, that when I think about technological revolutions in, in human history, even industrialization, and naturally, at the time of the transition, we see that certain type of individuals, certain segments of societies are being displaced and are replaced by other type of individuals. So great <coughs> unemployment is emerging during technological transition. But ultimately, as we saw in the course of the Industrial Revolution, there is a new demand for new set of skills that, again, at the time could not be fully envisioned and perhaps the same will hold true in the context of, uh, uh, of, of AI. So that's at least my hope. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have uh, time for a few short questions, uh, but remember there is a cocktail, so please, please keep, your, keep your questions short. Moshe. We will collect the questions, okay? okay. Right. I'll write them down just so. Well, I'm sure we'll read the, page, read the book now. I don't know before Shakespeare, after Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> but if you were to move back 2,000 years, do you think that you would be able to write a similar book about the next 2,000 years? I don't know. This is a real question. Or asking it differently, if you move 2,000 years from now, it might just well be that uh, this 2,000 year you're referring to as the emergence of everything would be just a blip in uh, some what you thought about this? Right. So, so that's an interesting question, and uh, and I think that this is part of the virtue of unified growth theory. So, when I wrote unified growth theory, part of the way that I advocated the need for unified growth theory is that if you have a theory that rests on the foundations of a longer period of time, the likelihood that this theory will survive the next iteration is much larger. So, if you think about, say the solar growth model, endogenous growth models, they're predicated on certain conditions that exist over a short period of time, and therefore, certainly they do not fit the past, they do not fit the Malthusian epoch, they cannot explain to us the transition from stagnation to growth, and they cannot explain the emergence of inequality across the globe. In fact, what they predict is convergence, which did not occur in this 200-year period. So the virtue of unified growth theory is that it is resting on, on, on wider foundations and in this respect is more likely to survive and predict the future more accurately. But in addition, remember, if I would uh, reside, say, in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, I would be a contemporary of Jesus at the time, I think I would probably be able to make similar predictions, not accurate predictions, but similar one, in the sense that I will identify the wheels of change, I will see that there is something that is operating, in the sense that there is interesting interaction between technology, the size of the human population, and the adaptation of the human population, and nevertheless I will realize that there is a process of stagnation in income per capita. But I will realize that this process is accelerating, and therefore I will realize that perhaps technological progress will reach a point in which the speed of technological progress will be so large that it will require some change. 
it's possible that 2,000 years ago, I would not be able to conceptualize the concept of <coughs> human capital and to realize that this will generate a demand for human capital and as a result of it, a fertility decline. But it's not inconceivable that, that, uh, that it, is, it was possible to envision it even at that time period in the sense that you could see how fertility is behaving in the context of, uh, of different investment in children at the time and possibly this, was, this would have been possible. But naturally, if there will be a dramatic technological shift uh, that will occur, say, 50 years from now or 200 years from now, it is possible that, again, the, the model uh, will not survive this iteration. It's, it's entirely possible. But as I said, the, the confidence is that the model is fitting such a long part of human history. Plus, it's not, it's not a monotonic period. It's a period in which we see the Malthusian stagnation and then the, more, the transition to modern growth. So the fact that the model fits this uh, sort of uh, two distinct type of, uh, of uh, regime or paradigms is increasing the confidence that, that one can expect survivability of this model more than otherwise. Okay, so just we take three, four questions together and, uh, and then uh, give floor to Odette to respond. The question here in the center, then the question in the back, then uh, Ruben and then Hila. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for your great lecture. Uh, my question is, what role has played more recent migration episodes such as trade slave or white war exodus <coughs> in this conflicting effect of diversity? Okay, gentlemen in the back. Yeah, thanks for your last piece. This is really, really amazing. Uh, as an African myself, I'm specifically interested in something you didn't really touch on why you were talking. It's like this phase transition from the political economy of slavery to that of colonialism. How does it help our understanding of inequality? How can we explain inequality through this, this transition? Because you tend to talk more about colonialism and, and asymmetric, asymmetric tree, excuse me. But what about this specific link between slavery as an institution and, and, and as an entire economic process and, and joining that with colonialism? Especially now where we have neoliberal policies and market-driven reforms that are basically pro-capitalism. How do we think about this issue of inequality? Do you think it's some self-reinforcing uh, process where you have greater inequality rather than addressing this specific concern. Thank you. Thank you. Ruben? Yes, so I wanted to touch upon an aspect that <clears throat> I liked about the diversity in, in new countries. And in particular, I, I was wondering how do you see the consequences of the increased polarization that, that, that we observe uh, across ideological lines, party lines, and so on. How can this relate with uh, <clears throat> all the, the processes that that you've been talking about here, and potentially how can this be destructive force, especially when it's fueled by politicians that can kind of cater to specific audiences? How how do you see this uh, kind of playing out in the in the overall framework that you described? And the very last uh, question, Hillel. Uh, so, two, two short points uh, regarding your last answer. How come Malthus could be uh, not 2,000 years ago, but 300 years ago, in England, the most advanced country did not spot what you, you argue you could have spotted from Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> it's the education of Hebrew University in Jerusalem, right? <laughs> and, uh, to land on the French note, uh, and I would say that the, the French fertility puzzle is, is an outlier, so the fact that France was the first country to start the democratic transition in one century England, while it was much less advanced at the time uh, than, than England, how, how does it fit into your, your model, except for saying that the French are culturally exceptional? <laughs> 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 so you need to write another book uh, yes. the, the, in uh, two or three or four minutes. Indeed. Because, uh, so so let, me, let me order it in a way that I will start with Malthus, and then I will uh, refer to the issues of diversity and slavery. So, um, so th about the limitation of, uh, of Malthus. So I suppose that it's going beyond uh, the Hebrew University versus uh, Oxford at the time, I think. 
Uh, and I think that it is, I mean, naturally, Maldus is living at a time period that is before the transition. And then Moshe was asking me about uh, 2,000 years ago. And I said that, in fact, a good observer 2,000 years ago could have probably predicted some of the processes. So, so perhaps it is partly the sort of the religious orientation of Maltus that caused him to view humans in a, in a very similar fashion to uh, to rabbits, and uh, basically the people that are driven by uh, sexual passion, and as a result of it, a desire to reproduce that cannot be stopped. And as a result of it, he talked about population that is increasing in an exponential rate, food production that is increasing at an arithmetic rate, and he said, this is incompatible, and as a result of it, humanity is doomed to live in poverty forever after. Now, Naturally, I mean, he didn't explore sufficiently well, and perhaps the data was not there for him to explore it properly. The technological progress was accelerating over time, and at a certain point, he should have realized that we will move it in what we define today as the post malthusian regime, in the sense that resources will expand at, some, at such a pace that biological produ reproduction cannot catch up. Now, why didn't he see it? I think it's his own limitations. I mean, with all due respect. So that's... Uh, <laughs> um, yes. Now, in the context of... Um, um, pardon? Slavery. Yeah, in the context of slavery. So that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, observation. And let me, let me talk about it a little more broadly. So as I said earlier... When we think about slavery and when we think about colonialism, colonialism doesn't emerge out of the blue. I mean, we see differential and even development in the world prior to 1500, and ultimately, this allows certain societies across the, the globe to dominate others. Okay, so certain conditions that existed earlier, conditions that were more conducive to uh, to prosperity, say, in Euro-Asia than in Sub-Saharan Africa, led into differential development across the globe and ultimately led into uh, the possibility of some societies dominating others. And from this point onward, we see the imposition of extractive institutions and uh, the horrible institution of slavery that is emerging across different places uh, in the world. And this naturally persists for a long period of time, and the persistence of it is part of the legacy that, that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and other regions of the world must uh, battle with today. But again, given the fact that, uh, that one can, uh, can uh, educate a population differently, and given the fact that the institutions are not uh, written in stone, and one can reform institutions even if they, uh, they were extractive initially, then there is hope that initial conditions will not condemn sub-Saharan -Sub Africa into poverty, in the sense that one can overcome uh, this, uh, uh, these conditions. But broadly speaking, as I said before, so when we think about Colonialism, we should think about extraction, and we can think about uneven trade. And extraction naturally generated a great amount of inequality. This is literally theft of resources from one region of the world to another, and this is part of the inequality that we see across the globe. Now, does it, uh, I mean, it, 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 and it may have different type of political and uh, consequences in the context of how do you compensate those societies that were subjected to slavery and extraction over a pro prolonged period of time. So that's certainly something that modern society should think about in this context. Now, in the context of, uh, of diversity, so the first question is about migration and diversity, how <coughs> migration uh, 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 affect diversity. So naturally, when we think about the distribution of diversity across the globe, it's an outcome of the migration out of Africa. So there is an initial wave in which uh, humanity is populating the world, and this affects the degree of diversity across the globe. But then, for instance, we see massive migration in the post-1500 period, right? We see massive migration from the old world to the new world. But interestingly enough, the most significant component of diversity is not diversity between groups, it is diversity within groups. Namely, migration 
has a second order effect in comparison to diversity within. So if you think about the United States, the reason that the United States is, uh, is flourishing today in terms of diversity doesn't necessarily have, have to do with the fact that in the United States we see a mixture of many different ethnic groups. It has to do with the fact that Native Americans that used to be highly homogeneous were replaced by Europeans predominantly that are significantly more diverse and are very close to the optimal level. So it's not the case that if you will flood the US with migration from different places across the globe, it will have a first order effect. The first order effect is diversity within as opposed to uh, diversity between. Okay? So if you ask yourself today, suppose that China is battling with the issue, can we survive the next technological paradigm with such an homogeneous society? So when we think about China and in in Europe, in the Middle Ages, naturally China is dominating technologically, but ultimately it is Europe that is taking off first, partly because of cultural fluidity that is present in Europe that allows the society to adopt ideas of enlightenment, forward-looking behavior, and ultimately to move into the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and, uh, and further in, in this dimension. So, but at the moment that China moved into the modern growth regime with on almost 200 year delay, then they are more effective within this regime than other societies because they are very cohesive socially. And given the technological paradigm, they can operate very well. But again, if a new technology will emerge, then they will be left behind again because they do not have the fluidity that will allow them to make this adaptation. So the remedy for China is not necessarily in the context of immigration, say, from Africa, that is significantly more diverse. The remedy for them is predominantly education policies that will foster cultural diversity within. Naturally, you can achieve some of it with immigration, but this will be a second-order effect. That's at least what my... Uh, my research shows. Next to Ruben's question about polarization and exploitation of, uh, of polarization by politicians, so naturally when we think about uh, today's societies and we think about sort of the, the success of uh, the US story, a relatively uh, diverse society, some of this diversity is leading precisely into the type of political polarization that we see in the society, in the sense that we have diversity in many different dimensions. We have diversity in productive traits that can be beneficial for innovations, but we have diversity in political preferences and preferences about public goods that are ultimately generating more conflict. And as you suggested, wise politician, quote unquote, can exploit this diversity and division within society to entrench this, uh, this rift in society and ultimately increase the cost of diversity beyond what is present at the moment. And this suggests that, in fact, modern societies that are largely uh, uh, heterogeneous <coughs> ought to invest more in assuring the proper education of society so as to prevent the ability of uh, of people like Trump in creating division that is larger than otherwise. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Oded. Uh, let's uh, run a round of applause. Uh, you can meet us the uh, March of Humanity will continue. Uh, and let's hope it will be through development of great technology rather than reduction in population like in the Black Death times. So, thank you. There is a cocktail outside. Thank you so much.